Hi everyone, it's me. And today, let's watch this video about Captain America together. Let's go. So people ask me all the time about theories that don't make mm. the cut. Well, here's one for you. When I first wanted to do an episode on Falcon and the Winter Soldier, I was hoping that I could expose Bucky as a secret millionaire. You see, Falcon and the Winter Soldier deals a lot with Sam's financial troubles. I know your family has banked with us for generations, but we cannot approve you. Which, in and of itself, is kind of ridiculous, considering he's a main hired gun for the world's most powerful private military. It's probably a theory for another day, but no one ever talks about Buck, even though he's had decades to grow his wealth while he sat in the ground frozen. I mean, my schools True. didn't teach me much about money, but they did teach me the power of compound interest, baby! Compound interest! Think about it. For 10 years, for 20 years, for 30, 50, 100 years, the money's going to increase. Invest a bit now, and in like a bunch of years, you're gonna be a millionaire. So I was like, I'm gonna calculate how much Bucky Barnes would earn in interest since 1942. And I bet that we're gonna find out that he's like one of the richest characters in the Marvel Universe. So I broke out the old number cruncher. Thanks to the 1942 Pay Readjustment Act, we know how much Bucky would be making throughout his career. As an army private first class in World War II, his salary would have been about $50 a month. Doesn't sound like a lot, but remember, this is old timey dollars. Those are especially during World War II. They're always worth a bunch more. He probably got promoted up to corporal right out of training camp and started making $66 a month. By the time he visits Steve Rogers at the beginning of Captain America, he was a sergeant and would be making $78 a month until his last two months in service, in which a 5% bonus would kick in, earning him $81.90. That totals just around $2,788 throughout his military career. Let's then say that he was a financially savvy guy and got himself a 3% interest savings account compound monthly into which he deposited his whole paycheck. That means that through his military career, Sorry. Bucky Barnes would have earned roughly $4,940.94. Case in point, I just love the mathematics at the start of the video. It's not exactly what I was hoping for and definitely not enough money to warrant getting thrown off a train and losing your arm. But wait for it, after 78 years of compound interest, drum roll please! <laughs> Wait, that's it? It still only comes huh? out to $51,143.50? After 78 years, Bucky is still not even beating the average income for an American male in 2020 at $52,004? Moral of the story, don't trust Mr. Cole, my 10th grade economics teacher. Compound interest, meh. All in on Dogecoin! <gasps> oh! Hello, internet! Welcome to Film Theory. Hello Internet! Welcome to Film Theory! Hello! Alright, story time! Alright, just one, one, one more first story time. You know, there is this, like, uh, back when Bitcoin was still a new, new one thing, right? Uh, so there was a sports competition. The first prize, $500! Second prize, $300! Third prize, 200 Bitcoin. I did my calculations, it's nearly 12 million SGD. Mm. Mm. Man, I would love I would love to be the first prize uh, first I would, I would love to get the first prize or the second prize, but the third prize is millions of dollars! Oh gosh! The show that tries to do Better. Speaking of being better, if you want to be better at working from home, check out the interview we just did over on the Rocket Learn YouTube channel, our sponsor for today's episode. Steph and I went on their new series, Big Change, to share our experiences trying to work at home with your significant other for nearly a decade. Nowadays, I think most of us are going through something like that, so learn the importance of headphones, desks, and honest conversations with your roommates by checking out that episode. True, have more understanding, um, recognize your flaws, recognize their flaws, recognize that sometimes situations we need to be more understanding towards each other. Mm. Link is down in the description below and at the end of the video. Now, if you ended up passing on the first season of Falcon and the Winter Soldier, first of all, you missed out on a piece of the MCU that could most definitely do better. The whole thing kind of feels rushed better. and chopped to pieces. It's fine, I guess, but it feels like the first real Marvel property to struggle with the balance between telling a compelling story while also being beholden to setting up the next five years worth 
worth of Marvel plots and merch bait. That said, while it certainly wasn't one of the most highly rated MCU projects, it does present lots of interesting ideas, even if it doesn't always do a good job of fleshing them out. Case in point, the iconic line to come out of the season one finale episode, be better. And what the heck that actually means, other than it just being great meme bait. Quick flashback to what leads up to this famous line in case you've been sleeping on the series or the last three MCU movies. Back in 2017, Thanos, that's the purple guy here, snapped half of the universe out of existence. Poof! Five years later, the Avengers, specifically Hulk, undid the snap, bringing everyone right back to where they were when they disappeared. They didn't reverse time or anything, they just created some three and a half billion people out of thin air. Now, back when I told the world that Thanos unfortunately was right, I talked about how a new abundance of resources and production would make life for the remaining population significantly easier. Well, this time around, we actually have the opposite situation. A world that had dealt with and moved past the three and a half billion deaths, built to only serve some three and a half billion people, suddenly having to serve double that amount. That's the primary cause of the events of Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Our sort of antagonist, Carly Morgenthau, has benefited tremendously from what's now referred to as the blip, along with a bunch of other outcasts, refugees, and marginalized groups who fled their oppressive countries during the snap times. These people do not want to go back to how life was before the blip, and their organization, the Flag Smashers, has the goal of keeping country borders down to allow displaced people to stay in their new lives. But Carly isn't exactly peaceful about it. In her final act, she attacks a meeting of the Global Repatriation Council, which is an organization aiming to return things to the way they were pre-snap. Case and point, you must recognize that these individuals are just innocents. Literally, Tano says that random individuals, random individuals just poof, gone. Mm. He's eventually stopped by Sam Wilson as the brand new Captain America and killed by the power broker. Cut and roll credits, right? Wrong. Sam, as an ethnic minority, sympathizes with her mission and lectures the Global Repatriation Council members about being better in a nearly four minute monologue. For four minutes, he speaks truth to power. Yeah, stick it to those government bigwigs, is what the swelling impassioned music wants you to believe. But when you actually listen to Sam's words, they sound pretty, but they're ultimately hollow. Our Peacekeeping troops will begin relocating people soon. The terrorists only set us back a bit. You have to stop calling them terrorists. Stop calling them terrorists, he says, about a group of people that bombed buildings and killed people to get their message across. No matter how noble your message is, that's just not okay. But it continues. And the people who reappeared only to find someone else living in their family home. They just end up homeless. Look, I get it. But you have no idea how complicated this situation is. You know what? You're right. And that's a good thing. We finally have a common struggle now. Way to deflect the question there, Sam. Government dude's like, hey, you don't get it, superhero guy. This is a tough problem to solve. And Sam responds with a, well, yeah, but now you know what it's like to feel helpless and hated by people. That is... MetPat, I think what he says is correct. MetPat, you're wrong. In the sense, oh, you're not necessarily wrong, but you're implying that... You're implying that the suffering was unbiased. That is not the point of this conversation, Sam. The senators are talking about how there's no perfect solutions to these humanitarian problems. You're talking about why it's time they get hate for their decisions. You see, all these are two separate conversations that have nothing to do with each other. By the no, 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 no. These two are separate conversations. Yes, I agree with you, but they have links to each other, all right? The this is saying, um, it's only after we learn from our past in which we can progress in the future. Or something like that. Some, some, something along the, the line. end of the speech, here's his advice. You've got to do better, Senator. You've got to step up. Be better. Be better at what? Solving the complicated housing, food, and humanitarian issues of a planet that just doubled in population? Just feed everyone. Find everyone a home. Give everyone medical care, clean water, a job. And while we're at it, that better probably include fair working conditions and appropriate retirement, childcare, access to technology, literally everything a functioning society needs. Just provide all of that. Easy. But you have no idea how complicated this situation is. We finally have a common struggle now. No! True. No you don't! Your job is punching aliens in the face! Just do better! Now before I ruin this idea for everyone, which is of course where this is going because this is film theory, I wanna- uh, uh, I recognize that film theory you ruin things, but seriously... <laughs> you are trying- What? I'm trying to- I, uh, I'm getting the vibe that you are trying to 
dong 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 sidestep the the complicated stuff that's happening even in real life the unbiased oh sorry the biasness the racism involved if we can solve things in a fictional world maybe that can be a clue to solving things in the real world isn't it correct my pet maybe I get what you're trying to say, but maybe don't phrase your sentence that way. You can literally do better. Come on, Mad Pat. It's just a fictional world. If you can solve the fictional world's problem, maybe you can solve ours, right? Acknowledge that for as hard of a time as I'm giving Sam here, and more importantly, not Sam himself, but the writers of this scene, his okay, message I'm does so. resonate with a lot of us at the end of the incredibly hard year that was 2020. In 2020, every single person watching this and writing, editing, or publishing this felt like our health, our communities, our families, jobs, financial security, and personal liberties were all put into jeopardy. Especially 2021 is smack dab in the global pandemic period. No matter how many weird plot choices or confusing narrative elements Falcon and the Winter Soldier had, Sam's sentiment here is hashtag relatable. Every person True. out there has wanted to say something like this to a local, national, or international leadership person. In the real world. But that said, what exactly is he saying? It's one thing to speak pretty words, but it's another thing to actually solve the problem. He's literally asking this council to solve all humanitarian problems throughout the entire world with a stroke of a pen. Well, let's see if we can put into words what doing better would actually look like. This one's gonna be great, friends. One YouTube video to try and solve the world's limited supply of resources. I am sure that this is going to be achievable in every way. First, let's talk about the Global Repatriation Council. We're told by Carly that the GRC's primary interest is the people who got blipped out of existence for five years and not the people who actually lived through those five years. To start, this is a strange philosophy that goes completely counter to the legal system of almost every first world country. Everyone who has blipped away was essentially presumed dead by everyone left behind. Case in points, you also presume they are first world countries after the blip, correct? You must recognize that maybe, after may maybe, they blitz away half of wait, wait, the half that Thanos blitz away was all the ministers, the kings, the royalties, the presidents, the highnesses, um, the people that is in charge, the leadership, all poof gone by random. Unfortunate randomness, but by random. When that happens, maybe the first world countries will never will no longer be first world countries in a fictional world. And as such, the governments would start dealing with their estates as if they had died. While different countries and states have a range of laws, they all tend to follow the same general philosophy. You can't unspill a glass of milk. Think about it like this. After someone dies, there are plenty of assets that just go on to the next of kin. Things like cars and houses are obvious, but literally all your stuff goes to someone else. And while I love my parents, if something awful should happen to them, I'm not going to be hanging on to every pair of my dad's underwear for the rest of my life. Also, my parents have a lot of the same stuff I have. Maybe their lawnmower is better than mine, but that just means that when I inherit their lawnmower, mine's going into a garage sale. Usually within a month of somebody dying, or being declared dead, their former possessions get strewn across dozens of owners and their money starts being spent. As such, most laws are written such that it's not easy for someone who's disappeared to come back and reclaim their life. Then we change the laws. The laws are created by man, are created by human, are created by people. So why don't we change the laws? Especially when half of the entire population just gone. That, this is a good chance to learn from our mistakes. Especially when a mistake literally just happened. Uh, One yeah. state that does handle things better is Pennsylvania, where declaring somebody dead without clear evidence that they are actually dead requires the claimant to post a bond for the value of the dead person's assets. This way, if the person does show up, the state can either return the assets or at least give them a fair bit of money to help compensate them. But when half the population gets blipped out in front of everyone's eyes, it might be considered clear evidence of death. If not, I feel awful for the bonds industry of MCU Pennsylvania, which just went entirely bankrupt to pay for half off the state's reappearance. Speaking of inheritance, I think there's some logic that we can all follow about how it's not really fair to give someone back a house after another person took care of it for the last five years. Houses are assets, but they're not like a bar of gold that just sits there gaining value. Houses need constant maintenance. Lawns need to be mowed, gutters need to be cleaned, roofs need retiling, all as a completely natural part of owning a home. If um, let that stop for a moment first. I think we are thinking from the point of view of a non-crisis. 
an individual. Oh, sorry. You are thinking from a point of view of someone that is not under a crisis, uh, especially a global crisis. Half of the entire population gone. I'm pretty sure that is a global crisis. Actually, no. That's a galactical, universal. Yeah, you, you get the point. You get the point. Then entire planet that we live in, it's it's a huge crisis, right? So when crisis uh, occurs, uh, laws, rules, regulations, they will change, correct? And this is a story that occurs years after the first. Uh, after the first, you should have gone for the hate. So a lot of things may have changed. Um, people recognize that they are still under a crisis uh, period, crisis situation. You rent an apartment, your landlord is probably handling most of those things, which is why you pay them probably more than you would be paying a bank for the mortgage on the same property. That means that if you aren't actively maintaining a house or actively paying rent on the house, someone else is laboring for you for free. You might be surprised to know that most countries have thought of this and actually have developed laws around what's called squatters' rights. Squatters' rights vary significantly from country to country and state to state, like any set of rules, but the general concept is that you can't kick someone out of their place of residence without warning, even if they aren't paying for it. Now, the GRC is clearly giving a lot of people in the world warning that they're about to be evicted from their homes, but also, most of these people are presumably paying for those homes. In Spider-Man Far From Home, Aunt May tells us that she appeared suddenly in her old apartment where people were living. When I flipped back to my apartment, the family that was living there was very confused. The wife thought that I was a mistress. It doesn't sound like that family was just squatting there, it sounds like they had legitimately moved in. Even if not, many states have statutes that allow a squatter, someone who's been living there for free, to pay to gain ownership of the home if they can prove that they've maintained or improved the property. Since most of these residents had actually been paying the whole time, the law as it's written would ensure that they had the rights to stay there. So yeah, Sam has a point here. The Global Repatriation Council is doing some really weird business in that they're trying to corral people back to their former countries when legally, these people should have the right to live in the properties where they're currently living. That being said, this is totally an un unprecedented world event, clearly you're gonna have to make some drastic choices, can't just leave 3.5 billion people homeless. And the fact is that now the demand for everything, from food, housing, clothing, medicine, all of it has doubled in every possible way. According Which task you must recognize that in that world, your, your, the, your presumed rights, your presumed freedom will have to change significantly for a long duration maybe a couple of eras, a couple of decades, a couple of generations. Case in point, uh, uh, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Xi Shen Xiao Wo, Wan Chen Da Wo. According to everyone's high school introductory economics course, the increasing demand with the flat line of supply should mean that the prices on everything in the world would be skyrocketing to unbelievable levels. Alternatively, if price controls are in place, there's gonna be shortages of pretty much everything as humanity scoops up what little supply there is. And while all the rest of this is happening, the people who have just reappeared need immediate help. I mean, most are immediately homeless, most are immediately jobless, their families and most importantly their assets are just gone to who knows where. The point is that these returners don't have the ability to pay skyrocketing prices to keep up with demand. So the GRC has this really difficult choice here. If they create some sort of legislation to keep prices from doubling overnight, they might save families from being evicted and starving, but they also might force everyone into an extreme resource shortage faster and worse than it would happen naturally. So tell me, Captain America, which of these options is doing better? Well, what if there was a third option? In a world where we've all been watching our mailboxes and making our memes about the COVID relief checks. What about government relief? Open up that money printer and give people the cash. Most money today is digital and the federal government could just fulfill banks money orders by literally printing enough money to replenish the empty accounts of those who were snapped away. This however causes yet another big problem, inflation. Even just with 2020, the United States Federal Reserve hasn't exactly been reserved about printing a lot of money to infuse into the parts of the economy that needed it the most over the last 18 months. We're seeing tons of articles about inflation actually 
actually happening right here, right now, as we speak. Because that's just what happens when the market floods with a lot of new money. For us, inflation might be more temporary. But in a post-blip world, the amount of money that would have to be printed to reimburse 3.5 billion people would cause inflation at a level that is impossible to comprehend. Imagine every country in the world just printing banknotes. They immediately become useless pieces of paper. If you need a primer on inflation, we actually covered it in depth over on Game Theory when we talked about the World of Warcraft economy. Now, when inflation gets out of control, it's called hyperinflation. And you can see modern examples of it in places like Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe's troubles began in the 1990s when dictator Robert Mugabe instituted a racial policy to evict white landowners from their farms and replace them with black farmers instead. However, many of these newly landed farmers had no farming experience and little in the ways of capital to finance things like equipment. So in just a few years, Zimbabwe's food output had dropped nearly 45%. However, Mugabe wanted to continue intervening in wars in his region and thus started printing Zimbabwe dollars to pay for his military. At its peak, Zimbabwe was experiencing a staggering 89.7 sextillion percent annual inflation. Any money that you acquired at the beginning of the year was completely worthless by the end of the year. So I remember that's, um, that's the existence of 100 trillion dollars, right? To put that kind of inflation into perspective, with numbers like that, it would make Jeff Bezos, the world's richest man at $186 billion, worth a fraction of a penny in a year. Now, obviously things wouldn't be that bad for most countries printing money for the blip citizens, since the most that they would probably do is increase inflation by 100%, but that's still way more inflation than most countries can handle. Right after its founding in 1776, the United States experienced the most inflation in its history, with its currency inflating 29.78%. It is never a good solution, but it is technically a solution. Now, for people like Carly Morgenthau in the show, the people who've survived for the last five years, this solution will definitely suck, because any money that she and everyone else around her have earned honestly in the past five years of working will instantly be worth half or less than it was before, and items will suddenly cost at least double. People who were disenfranchised or below the poverty line have now spent the last five years earning more than they could have ever earned before, because now their labor is more needed than ever in a post- world. Suddenly, though, with all this inflation, they're disenfranchised again, and all the money that they've earned is worth a fraction of what it used to be. Un True, case in point, the incentive does help. But, I have a different solution. Don't focus on money. Focus on people, keep on be, uh, um, do not focus on the money first. Focus on having food, shelter, water, Space, um, locations, uh, even if you build apartments, like um, places in which they have a roof above their head, that those are the uh, main priorities. Do not care about money, all right? Make sure they work so that they have food, they have work, they have shelter, all right? I know the incentive might not be so, might be missing. The, the the incentive might, might be missing, but case in point, the most important thing is the life of the people, the lives of the people. Money can be earned, money can be increased or decreased, but the human life are important, isn't it? I will make them, I will force them to say that you need to survive without endangering other people, without uh, under survive for the next five years, survive for the next ten years, heck, don't, don't even know, survive for the next two, three years. Make sure that you survive for the next two, three years. This is the most important thing. Within the next two, three years, we can build apartments, we can build houses, we can plow farms. We can increase the supply so that um, so, so that at the very least, even though your rights, your freedom may be gone, you will be alive. Everybody will be alive. And from there, we, we, have, the, we have the time. We have the privilege by then to continue improving our society. Right?
On top of all of it, with this massive population flood, labor now becomes incredibly cheap. There are so many people who need jobs, so the competition to actually keep the job that you had during the blip is going to be completely impossible. So at that point, you have 3.5 billion people who are sort of okay, 3.5 billion people who are pretty mad at the other half, and very, very expensive bread for everyone. So what is Captain America's plan here? Well, he might actually have the answers, even though he doesn't feel like sharing. In The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, we watched Sam deal with a lot of the issues the blipped are facing. He can't get a loan because he has five years of no income. He's afraid that he'll need to sell his family's boat, and his sister is worried about the rent going up again. Sam doesn't really solve any of those problems, but he does manage to get his mother's boat fixed up by cashing in on goodwill. He rallies his community behind a common goal, and he gets it done. Carly talks about the same thing when she opines for the days when it wasn't every man for themselves. Instead, we got a glimpse of how things could be. No, the reality of the situation isn't be better, Senator Man. It's inspire others to be better. At the end of the day, Carly was wrong to be attacking the GRC, not just because it's an international crime and she was turning her friends into biological weapons, but because the GRC isn't the ones with the power here. They're not going to be able to come up with a solution that's going to be satisfying to everyone. That sort of thing is just impossible. Con yes, but case in point, the most important thing is to make sure everybody, everybody, everybody stay alive. Make it a necessity. Everybody must work so that uh, in the farm, everybody must work in construction. Make sure that everybody, no matter if you're a lawyer, an accountant, or businessman, a trader, you work in the farm right now. I don't care if you uh, do it because for the benefit of everyone, isn't it correct? Maybe two years later, three years later, you can get back to an office job. When, uh, when the supply stabilizes. But, just the hand for the next five, ten years. Lah. Right? Country borders or no country borders, what needs to be. Your rights, your freedoms, your. It's, it's useless. It's genuinely useless at that point of time. Right? Okay? better is people's willingness to work together as individuals to get through times of crisis. Sure the good news that. is that unbeknownst to the filming team who shot the show starting back in October of 2019, people are actually capable of that. They're capable of collectively doing things for the greater good, like wearing masks, delivering food, donating money and time and literal oxygen. At least enough of us are good enough at that that it can get the entire world through a major global upheaval. Carly was right. The GRC is trying to make things the way they were before the blip, and that's a bad plan. At this point in the MCU, people People need to collectively be doing things they had never done before. The GRC is trying to make things the way they were before the blip by just trying to hit the rewind button. But the thing is, there is no rewind button once a major global disaster strikes. There's no putting that cat back in the bag, friends. Listen to us over here in 2021. We would know. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And I know you're pretty sad that this episode's ending. I know you're probably like, wow, I wish I could keep watching that Matthew Patrick guy. See what he's up to, get all buddy buddy with him? Well, wouldn't you know it, you're in luck. Today's sponsor, Rocket Mortgage, interviewed me and my partner, Steph, over on the Rocket Learn YouTube channel all about how we run these channels, make this content, and manage to have life, if you squint at it really hard. When we're not talking about the issues of nationalization, border control, and global crises of the Marvel Universe, we're, uh, well, we're probably researching another episode, but we do it all from our house and have been for years. On this episode of their series, Big Change, we show and talk about the place we actually live, which is not the sort of thing that we typically do. We're not big YouTube house tour kind of people, but in this behind the scenes sneak peek, we actually talk about how we make our lives work and what it was like being stuck in the same house as your business partner during 2020. We literally run our business around the world from our basement and do it all in the comfort of stretchy sweatpants that camouflage how bad our pandemic diet really was. If and uh, case in point, recognizing uh, the fact that uh, Matt Pat and his partner both work in the same... Yeah channel, um, the theorist community, yeah, it can get, sometimes when mm, mm, shit hit the fan, um, things can get emotional, things can get messy, and yeah, uh, I'm glad that it's currently working out for my pen and Stephanie, I, I'm glad that it's happening, uh, and I hope that maybe you can improve for the benefit of everyone in this world stronger together. If you're interested in how you can run your own YouTube business or work from home better or organize your space to make it happen, give it a watch. So click the link that's down in the description or 
paper that's on the screen right now or is in the upper right hand corner of your TV and show us and them some love. Thank you all so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video and cut. Anyways, thank you all so much for watching this video together with me. I hope you find this video very interesting and just needed to watch. Um, like, what would you have done under this sort of situations where you have the power of leadership, when you are, uh, when you have the say in the leadership uh, role? What would you have done? I would have made sure that everyone for the next two years, three years, if cannot five, ten years, uh, make sure that everybody. <laughs> Stop being a lawyer, stop being an accountant, stop being a businessman, stop being a trader. Start farming. Start construction work. For the next two years, three years, put down a pen, put down an office job, start working in a farmer, uh, uh, as a farmer. Majority of you. Of course, we still need to prevent crime, uh, prevent murder, bef uh, uh, be people might get drunk on alcohol, uh, under the influence of alcohol. We try to avoid that. But, uh, we need law enforcement, law enforcement as well, but majority of the individuals that weren't in agriculture before must be in agriculture right now, right here, right now, so that everybody can survive. That's that's what I think. What we have done. If you do like this video, please remember to like, share, and subscribe to my channel and comment down below if you have any share of us. Don't forget to follow my channel and sincerely appreciate all of your support and encouragement for my work. Thank you all so much for the best and I hope to see you all in my next video. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut. Thank you. And I hope to see you all in my next video. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Subscribe.